I've got to come forward with that uh, And I've spoken to particularly some of the Simon Lantern uh, Naval Physics Shield before. And but my, my main work, well, I'm a geographer, I'm, I'm a professional geographer, that's what I do for a living. I'm not a teacher, but geography is what I do. Uh, it's an observation, actually. The, 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 uh, how, many, how many of you are doing geography here as well? Study geography. Tiny, tiny amount, yeah. That, this is, every time I see the speaker to students like this, doing physics and geography, it doesn't go to every time. I don't know why. You know, they seem a very different cohort of students, actually. And an observation for me was actually, you're either looking up at stars, infinity, or you're looking down at the subatomic particles. And you're often looking here. Or when you were looking here, how do you actually deal with the information that's actually here in front of us? And one of the things I want to do today is to try and give you some skills and some techniques and knowledge and access to the technology that will allow you to deal with the data you're collecting. How do you go and catch your primary data? How do you manage your map and look at and assess your secondary data? And you see some of the videos talked this morning, and I'm going to show you some techniques that perhaps you can, you can apply to that data, and we'll show you some techniques based as well. So just a, this is me, oh, no it's not. This is me. Uh, so, Brief background, so Esri was founded in 1969. Uh, it's still owned by the same husband and wife who started it. I think it's the second largest private company in the States. And all of our schools work in the UK is uh, not for profit. Uh, we usually work with, I'm talking about with uh, Thierry on, on yeah. So I think he sort of wanted to work with Thierry on there with the, you asked about getting the phone data. So we've got the telecom companies, and so all the locations will the telephone masks. They know, they know where it is. They know how far you can actually uh, broadcast with those masks. This is all geography. I know this is as well, but actually the worst broadcast is all geography. And so tracking and working with the police, the police are a big client about, so working with them and tracking uh, your phone data from mask to mask and seeing where you are is one of the things that that technology kind of does. So this is Esri. And we work in a huge amount of industries. It seems to me, you know, sort of analogy is uh, GI, the technology we've been creating something for geographic information systems. And it seems like the black, the, uh, sort of dark matter really of uh, the software world, because it's everywhere, and no one knows anything about it. Uh, there's pretty much not an industry where everything that working, because most of the time, organisations, geography is part of their, their plan. But you're saying to this, where I've got my stores. Or your police force, where it's crime happening, the environment agency, the mess office, all these, all these organisations use that technology uh, to make decisions uh, about their business. So, so, just give you an idea, some of the, some of the things we've been doing are around uh, Tim Peak and some of the Tim Peak stuff. So using that technology base, we can mark GIS online. Uh, it's all cloud-based, so you haven't got to install anything. <coughs> so, we can take, so basically what we're taking here is Tim, Tim Peake's Flickr feed and maps input into an app. All the templates of this app are on GitHub, so you can download them, customise them, do whatever you want with them, or you can just take them straight out of the box and use them. Uh, so this is a bit of a, a maps in the media type of activity, and you can just you know, click on some of these points here, do all the photographs are taken with an latitude and longitude. As we go on to this, you can see that latitude and longitude, or some form of location, is a key thing to using this technology. And nothing that occurs to me whilst we were doing this, as another app, so you've got this, and again, open for coding, is the ability to actually look at this stuff in 3D. So this is all the, uh, uh, Australian, as we're in Australia, satellites in there. Uh, Japanese, Russian. So basically, just taking it back to the. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and putting put this all together. So basically, we're, we're, a, we're a mapping uh, platform that allows you to read a map and look at and visualize any sort of information you have. Okay? So, just to, that's just sort of showing this morning as you the, the talk is going on. Uh, so, we were talking about the South Atlantic anomaly this morning. This is a visualisation, a mapping inside a ArcGIS Online of this data. So, this 
So this is a typical stone cell, about 20,000 lines in there. If you start off looking at that, try and work out what does that mean? Unless you can have actually a really accurate idea of, a, of where all these electric monitors are, it's difficult, difficult to make any sense of it. But the geographic information system intrinsically understands where all these locations are. And it will take every one of those rows and it will put them exactly in the right place on the map. Okay. Uh, do you guys do you know uh, Thomas Hearing? Yeah. So, Thomas Hearing, uh, 2010, student of uh, Thomas Harley School, he won the Young Scientist of the Year competition. And he won it mapping uh, the ammonite beds on the Jurassic Coast, the erosion works there. And he used some older versions of our technology to go and do that, working at Bournemouth University. He's now doing a PhD at Leicester, looking at oxygen isotopes and sea temperatures in the Amazon region, of course. Not that yet. So again, this is sort of the next iteration from when uh, Tom Shearer was actually using this technology. What we can do, we can look at this. Then every time you take your, you have some primary data, you look at some lucid data, or where it happens to be, if you look at these, these fields, if you look at longitude and latitude, you know you can do something with it. You can actually take it from this, this, this piece of information here, and we can, we can actually create some really quite interesting maps to do that. So, okay, so how do we do that? Is that what you like this year? Yes. Yeah, I like to be using that. So, 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 let's, you know, the idea is when we were looking at uh, Fukushima and Chernobyl and other places like that, so actually, so, is it, is it making, is it, what we're comparing this data with against other data sets to see if there's a correlation. So, and we can really quite easily do it to our GIS online. So, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to turn off the data there for a second. Perhaps I might change my base map. We've got a whole bunch of different base maps in here to work with. So I might take my topographic map. And perhaps uh, Steve mentioned to me uh, last week of the course, week before, that some of one school was looking at the potential for actually plate tectonics, earthquakes, so they actually have an effect on here. So uh, what we can do, we can very quickly go out to the USGS earthquake site. United States Geological Survey, they measure earthquakes around the world, uh, and they know their data open. So, so essentially, that one, if they wouldn't change their website, it would be much more better for us. There you go. And what I'm looking for. Don't change the name. If anybody sees. So, 
of smart mapping, which is inserting the data for you, so it looks at the data and thinks, hmm, I think proportional points might be a good, good bet for this, using proportional points. We can map more variables on top of that if we want to. We're perhaps looking for, a, is there any fatality correlation when we're thinking about plate tectonics? And perhaps we might perhaps we just change the base map and look at the oceans. We can see Middle Atlantic Ridge. Is that enough? Or perhaps what we could do, we could search inside ArcGIS Online for some other information. So one of the things you can use ArcGIS Online for is, is another secondary source of information. There's lots of new atlas inside there. We've got some soils information for the RISE project. Is it RISE or RISE? Yeah, RISE. Uh, huge amounts of information. Think, think of ArcGIS Online. So there's millions and millions of maps inside here. Think of it as a cross between Wikipedia and YouTube, but for maps. Okay? And with that same caveat, it's how you might use it. Yeah? So what I can do inside here, I can go and say, okay, let's search for tectonics. I'll search ArcGIS Online. And I know my friends out in Ovi Nesri, I quite like them, they'll actually trust that data, about that ease. I need to trust them. There you go. So now we have, in the space of what? Taking the fact that I couldn't find the data in the first place, probably no less than five minutes. We're taking loads and loads of second data sources and thinking, is this, is this useful? Can we compare it? You know, and think of any other data that you may want to think of, we could probably bring it in and actually map it. What I'm going to do now is to put back on the Timpix data. Here we have our South Atlantic anomaly we talked about before. And again, you want to write the cartography slightly clearer so we can have a look at it. And perhaps we're going to do some analysis on here and do some of the work we did about your inverse root squared law. Is that right? That's how it work. Basically, just proving there's any problem anything from the ground. You know, just got nice. You know, just the ability to simply take information, if it has some location inside it, and location can do anything, it can be a postcode, yeah, it can be national issues, it can be easy to know things, it can be an address, depends on what you actually what you want to do. Even with this type of information and drop it into the map. Yeah, so it's, it's that easy for you, and this is all available right for you to use uh, as part of our schools program. Okay, so I think we'll, we should make new Tom, I'm thinking you want to see some of your lucid data, so that's what that's what I asked you earlier on. Have you got a big spreadsheet? What is locations in? And we can practice think about just dropping on the map and see, see what yeah. comes up. Yeah. So that's my that was my thoughts. Uh, so that's what I was asking. Okay. I'm going to get you to do something now. We're going to, we're going to have, a, have a bit of fun for the next five minutes. Uh, we want to ask them why. One of the things you want to be doing this is actually it's not only looking at the second data, but actually collecting your own primary data, how you might do that. Citizen science, crowdsourcing. You come across crowdsourcing? Yeah, basically you know, getting other people to give you stuff. Yeah, really easy. Uh, inside Access Online, you can set up forms very, very quickly to go and crowdsource information. We can also go and collect information on our mobile phones. Or on our mobile phone. uh, so what we're going to do now. We're going to help Steve when he spoke this morning about uh, the Horticultural Society project. Hoping to launch in, uh, in a few days or ten days' time or so. Now we've got a, a new piece, of, new piece of kit out uh, called the Crowdsource uh, Reporter. It's still in beta. I want you guys to actually test it for me. And so I've created a slide mapper. Yeah. Now it took me longer to find that image than did to actually set this up. Yeah? I don't believe that. Yeah. If, you, if you Google high res slug, you get all these. Yeah? And that's a banana slug. Yeah. So it's I'm just one step ahead of the game, I think, uh, on this. Now, inside Arts Online, I, I, I can just go to this, uh, and it's a little template inside Arts Online. Again, it's, in, it's on GitHub, you can download it, you can do it a little bit. Uh, and if I click on here, you can see some of the entries I made earlier on. Now, you may notice that one of those is in the slug. Yep. Yeah. You've got a mass over there, you can see it, and this is, that's where Brian is. Now, Brian isn't the slug, but I'll have to admit that now, okay? So, what the activities I want to do now, actually, is to test out this new application, and test out perhaps the crowdsourcing for the new slug projects, is 
to get out of the phones. You got the phones on you? Please? So get out of the phones, make sure to turn them on. And just at the start, actually. Have you got pens with you as well? If you ever get, to get someone with a pen. And what I'd like to do is go to this URL. In case you can't see that, here it is. It's on the URL. It's case sensitive. And I'm going to give you instructions. And I want you to actually take a pen. And I want a variety of drawn slugs on thumbs and fingers. Please. Can you draw on somebody else's finger? Not mine. And I want a photograph, but just go, through, go to that there, go to the app, and you're going to click on, it'll either say participate or map the slide as a button. Click on that with your phones, and I want to start to populate our slug mapper with finger and thumb slugs as a test for each of this. I want you to see how easy it is to actually create and collect this information. It was a location, it was a location, I don't know if you want to try and find your location, put it here, or you can scroll somewhere else on the map, you can click on the map. I think I'll give you the name where you are. But, uh... So I purposely don't want to give you too many instructions, because this is supposed to be for any member of the public to pick up and use. Now that could be a complete lie, and it's too difficult. Hyde Park. So basically the research question is where is the quietest public place in Hyde Park? 
And what we'll do, we have a decibel app on our phone, on the phones of the students to come up to the RGS. Uh, and Online, and all this is available for you for free. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thanks.